daily news program from WorldLink TV presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. A huge explosion at an oil refinery in New York causes a big fire which threatens one of the city's district. Blair, Blair points to war and talks about evidence which links Al-Qaeda with Iraq. Rumsfeld asserts that the American forces are prepared for war. American Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld declared that the American forces in the Persian Gulf and in the surrounding areas around Iraq are prepared for President Bush's orders for war. Saddam Hussein doesn't cooperate, and he doesn't flee, and he isn't removed, and he is president is determined to see that he's disarmed. Meanwhile, within the framework of the preparations for a possible war in Iraq, the American forces in the Persian Gulf continued their training, whereas an American unit conducted their military exercises on the Kuwaiti island of Failaka. They trained for street wars and for living in an environment similar to Iraq. For more information on the subject, we now go to our correspondent in Kuwait, Hashim Ahl Barra. Hashim. What are the details of the American trainings in Kuwait, especially on the island of Failaka? First, I have two news reports. First, is that just a while ago, the American Department of Defense, the Pentagon, declared that an American soldier was injured during the military exercises on the island of Failaka. They are currently investigating the causes for his injuries, which occurred during trainings with live ammunition. However, they did not release any information regarding his condition. The other report is that the United Arab Emirates military sources confirmed the arrival of a military ship. It is carrying military equipment and cars. Whereas Emirate troops had arrived to Ali Salem's air base this week, and they brought with them Apache helicopters. According to the Emirate military source, the deployment of Emirate troops to Kuwait will be completed by the end of this month. Its duties will be limited to the protection of Kuwait's security and sovereignty according to the military agreements of the Gulf Cooperation Council. It is expected that a rocket launching boat and French-made tanks type Leclerc will be supplied to the Emirate troops with in the coming few days. Now, the Falaka maneuvers are very important because American military officials began planning for a second scenario in the event negotiations with Turkey over providing military bases to American troops fail. Therefore, the American army will transport all of the American troops to Kuwait and the Kurdish regions to begin the war. Analysts believe that it must be a quick war which would guarantee a quick victory according to American plans. Hashim, have you received any information regarding a land attack on Iraq from Kuwait? Yes, U.S. and British military officials are very reserved when it comes to declaring the number of troops that have arrived. But it is most likely that the number of U.S. troops in Kuwait may have exceeded 100,000 soldiers. In addition to another 100,000 soldiers in the Persian Gulf, there are also 26,000 British soldiers. It is expected that a unit of about 20,000 British soldiers will participate in the war, starting from the Iraqi-Kuwaiti borders, whereas these British forces will become part of the peacekeeping forces after the fall of the Iraqi regime. However, there are three challenges to this strategic war. The first challenge is weapons of mass destruction. The second challenge is the city and street wars. The third challenge is the delay of the declaration of war until after March, where the temperature increases. Nevertheless, the American military officers officials we've spoken to today confirmed that the United States Army is fully prepared. They are just waiting for President Bush to give them the green light to start the third Gulf War.
هاشم أهل برا our correspondent from Kuwait thank you very much furthermore UN sources in Baghdad reported that over half of the UN workers in Iraq have recently left the country UN officials who wanted to remain anonymous said that only 460 UN workers from its various agencies are still in Iraq President Hosni Mubarak gave a speech on Friday at the end of the two-day Franco-African summit held in the French capital Paris. During the speech, President Mubarak spoke of ways to combat terrorism and organized crime, stressing that regional international efforts should be reinforced to face that problem. More details on Mubarak's speech in the coming report by Nal TV's Nihan President Hosni Mubarak urged the international community to adopt a comprehensive and institutionalized framework for fighting terrorism, addressing a gathering of African leaders in the third plenary session of the French Africa Summit here in Paris. The president pointed out that during the past two years, several terrorist acts took place in which thousands fell victims, manifesting the evil face of terrorism and organized crime, which we had often warned against. He pointed out that the African continent had long suffered under the yoke of terrorism resulting from either political strife or the chronic problems facing Africa, to mention a few, poverty, debt, famine, or the new unfair trade regulations. Fundamentalism feeds on all these problems. President Mubarak reminded that the international community only began giving due attention to terrorism when the world's advanced countries were subjected to terror attacks. He criticized, however, the methodology with which this phenomena is being addressed, saying it lacks comprehensiveness as it focuses on means to fight terrorism, ignoring the root causes of the problem. The president said that the method adopted in facing terrorism is not effective in the absence of a comprehensive framework. The president laid emphasis on three points when addressing terrorism. One, Terrorism is not the product of a given religion, creed, or region. It's rather a reflection of the deficiency and incompetence of the international community in addressing political and economic problems in a fair and equitable manner. Such crises are the occupation of other people's territories by force, issues relevant to disarmament and small weapons, globalization, and sustainable development. Two, the necessity of creating a legal and solid framework to treat the problem that would be binding for all. Three, strengthening joint regional efforts that aim at uprooting terrorism. Having said that, the president noted that Egypt's regional efforts in Africa resulted in the implementation of the 1999 agreement of the OAU to combat terrorism. The working papers of the summit gatherings like Africa and Europe and France Africa included basic legislation aimed at settling disputes in Africa. The president concluded by praising the endorsement and support given by the EU and the G8 to the NEPAD, the new economic partnership for Africa's development. He said such support will boost regional efforts aimed at uprooting this problem. The president's paper was highly praised by President Chirac and the African leaders, describing it as extremely interesting. French President Jacques Chirac has wrapped up his meetings with African leaders here in the French capital, declaring France's commitment to the continent, urging them to do more themselves to end conflicts undermining its future. The African leaders, representing more than 40 countries, endorsed France's position on Iraq. They issued a statement saying military action against Saddam Hussein should only be undertaken as a last resort. The statement reads, there is an alternative to war. UN weapons inspectors should be given more time. The leaders expressed their support for continued inspections and for substantially reinforcing inspectors' technical capabilities in the framework of Resolution 1441. French President Jacques Chirac has been a major opponent of military action against Iraq. Germany has joined France, both traditional U.S. allies, in opposing the White House push to oust Saddam by force even if the United Nations does not approve. France has proposed to the UN Security Council that inspection team in Iraq be doubled or tripled from the current level of about 110. France also offered Mirage 4 fighter jets and other assistance to get the job done. 
On Thursday, France announced that the two Mirage 4 surveillance planes will leave Friday for the Middle East to help UN weapons inspectors as part of France's efforts to avert war by strengthening the hunt for Iraqi weapons. France says UN inspectors need more time and better means to hunt for Iraqi weapons of mass destruction and has sought to slow U.S. moves towards disarming Iraq by force. We have France, Mighty International, Paris. Whenever there is a local or regional event, Israel's military actions remind us that they are the biggest threat against Lebanon despite claiming that it wants to deter any possible attack and defend itself. While the local Lebanese population is closely watching regional and international developments regarding Iraq, and while the Lebanese government and its opposition have quietly accepted the third deployment stage of the Syrian troops in the north, Israel intensifies its military presence and pushes its tanks and anti-aircraft missile batteries toward the Lebanese borders without any warning. Israeli media focus its attention on the mobilization, claiming that it is intended to counter any possible attack from Hezbollah. Israel tries to turn the table as if Lebanon is threatening Israel. In reality, Lebanon is the country that fears a possible Israeli attack with the objective of transferring the Palestinians in mass numbers into its territories. Therefore, Israel may be preparing to attack Lebanon when the American war on Iraq distracts people's attentions away from Israeli crimes. This explains why the Lebanese cabinet ministers met and declared that Lebanon expects nothing from Israel but bad intentions and they are prepared for the worst. However, they confirm that they are not going to panic or be afraid of any possible assault against Lebanon. Visitors to southern Lebanon along the Israeli borders clearly notice that the Israelis have intensified their military presence on their side. This step surprised the Lebanese politicians who were occupied with the third deployment of the Syrian troops in the north. Though the Israelis did not link their recent mobilization with the Syrians, the timing makes one wonder about the Israeli motives. Israel claims that the objective is to counter any possible attack by Hezbollah. The Israeli media and its television in particular focused on the nature of the military mobilization, saying that it is unprecedented. The coverage included the images of the tanks and anti-aircraft missiles in Esma al-Jalil and al-Mitalli along the Lebanese borders. It is worth mentioning that there were no unusual movements by the resistance forces along the Lebanese side of the borders. However, the Lebanese army and security forces conducted security measures such as closing some paths and elevating sand walls in certain areas so Israel would not be able to take advantage of the possible American attack against Iraq to carry out Sharon's old dream of transferring the Palestinians in mass numbers into Lebanon. While the Lebanese resistance repeatedly confirmed that it is ready to counter any Israeli attack against Lebanon, it is very cautious not to create tensions along the borders with Israel. The spokesman of the international forces in the south, Fimor Kotsel, said that he observed quietness along the Lebanese borders with Israel and confirmed that the UNFEL forces did not notice anything out of the ordinary. Meanwhile, the American ambassador in Beirut, Vincent Battle, avoided commenting on the recent Israeli mobilizations and said, we take all violent acts along the blue line very seriously. The American administration carried out extended talks with the Israeli and Lebanese authorities. Two French Mirage 5 surveillance planes took off early Friday from an airbase in southern France for the Gulf 
where they are to help UN inspectors locate and identify suspected storage sites for alleged weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. They will carry out photographic reconnaissance missions, just like American, Ukrainian and German planes. The two were offered to the inspectors as part of a French, German, Russian proposal to boost the inspections. Russian Foreign Minister Igor Ivanov said that weapons inspectors were being pressured to provide a pretext for war. This came as U.S. military preparations continued with full strength around Iraq for a most probable war. If Saddam Hussein doesn't cooperate, and he doesn't flee, and he isn't removed, and he is, the president is determined to see that he's disarmed, then he will lead, he said, a coalition of willing countries. And there will be a large coalition. There'll be a lot of countries. This was Washington's latest threat of war against Iraq and a message to UN Security Council members unwilling to sanction the use of force. U.S. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld made clear some 150,000 U.S. forces in the Gulf are ready to invade Iraq. He is actively deceiving the inspectors. He's actively hiding the weapons. And so the Security Council earlier on gave Saddam Hussein one final chance to disarm. And he's throwing that chance away. This is not the opinion of Russia, France and Germany, which insist Iraq is cooperating. And in a strong command, Russian Foreign Minister Igor Ivanov said that UN weapons inspectors were being pressured to provide a pretext for war. Strong pressure is being exerted on the international inspectors to provoke their departure from Iraq as it happened in 1998 or to provoke them to come up with such assessments to the Security Council that would justify use of force against Iraq. If any country believes the use of veto meets its interests and interests of international stability and security, it has the prerogative to exercise this right granted by the United Nations Charter and Russia has not given up this right. Moscow was challenging Washington's war policy as Baghdad announced that a U-2 spy plane overflew the country for the second time this week as part of the UN disarmament operations. And UN experts stepped up inspections of facilities producing al samut 2 a missile the United Nations says is prohibited for exceeding the allowed range limit. But it seems the mission of inspectors is nearing its end and that of soldiers and warplanes is approaching. U.S. military preparations this time was observed in Romania's Constantas International Airport, where some 11 U.S. military transport planes landed Thursday night. Last week, Romania agreed to let the U.S. use its airports and airspace in a possible military strike against Iraq, and it will also contribute to a U.S.-led coalition with 278 non-combat troops. This came after the U.S. military had to delay its deployment in Turkey because negotiations over a financial package to compensate Turkey for economic losses from a possible war are taking longer than expected. Hanging in the balance was the deployment of some 40,000 U.S. troops to bases in Turkey. Despite the wrangling, huge U.S. cargo planes could be seen landing and taking off from the Inserlik base after dark on Thursday evening. A sophisticated communications aircraft, an airborne warning and control AWOC plane was also seen at the airbase. A source at the airbase who declined to be named said the amount of activity was highly unusual. U.S. Attorney General John Ashcroft announced the 50-count indictment of eight people, including South Florida University engineering professor Sami al aryan on charges of supporting the Palestinian Jihad movement. Ashcroft said the indictment are based on declassified wiretapes, accusing them of supporting so-called terrorism since 1984. He added that they were the result of what he called loosened restrictions on information sharing between U.S. intelligence agencies and law enforcement. al Aryan's attorney pointed that Sami is currently a political prisoner for believing in his right to support the Palestinian cause without fear of persecution by the U.S. government.
Israeli occupation troops dynamited two houses in the Western Refugee Camp in Khan Yunus Governorate after the Israeli tanks had rolled into the camp early this morning from Nebi de Kalim settlement. Witnesses said that four tanks and two bulldozers carried out an incursion at the Tufah roadblock area out of an incursion at the Tufah roadblock area west of the camp amid intensive firing with heavy machine gun and artillery. The Israeli troops also closed all main and side roads leading to Tufah roadblock. The Israeli occupation troops isolated the cities of Gaza Strip from each other, as well as dividing the Strip into three parts, leading to paralyzing all aspects of life. The Israeli occupation authorities started raising lands at the eastern Abba village in Jenin Governorate, aimed at establishing a new street connecting Ghanim settlement and the settlement bypass street east of Jenin. Member of the local council of Eastern Abba village said that the Israeli bulldozers uprooted olive trees as well as land leveling agricultural lands, pointing out that the Israeli Supreme Court rejected the objection of the village, asserting that the establishment of the new street will increase the isolation of the village from its surrounding. In Bethlehem Governorate, the Israeli occupation troops arrested the citizen Darar Mohammed Salim Amran, 21, after storming and searching his home. On the other hand, the Israeli troops are still imposing a military curfew on the governorate for the 19th day running. Meanwhile, the Israeli troops continued the storming and searching campaigns at the old town in Nablus for the second day running, where the Israeli troops dynamited the gates of homes during storming them and held up citizens at the school of Matir Dafer al-Masri to question them. The Israeli troops carried out an incursion this morning at Tammun town and imposed a tighten siege on it by setting military checkpoints at the entrances. Russia accused today the United States and Britain of putting strong pressure on UN weapons inspectors to provide a pretext for war against Iraq, as the U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell said that the U.S. might not wait for a new resolution to move against Iraq. More in the following report. The UN arms inspectors continue today their inspection operations in four Iraqi missile bases near Baghdad. The Chief Inspector, Mr. Hans Blix, is due to submit a report to the UN Security Council about the inspection activities conducted so far on the 1st of March amid wide rejection of Security Council members to issue a new resolution regarding Iraq. Russian Foreign Minister Igor Ivanov said that his country received information about the pressure practice of the UN experts to present evaluations that might be used as a pretext to use force against Iraq. Ivanov said that his country would not abstain from using veto at the UN Security Council concerning the Iraqi question. In a press conference he held following talks with his Indian counterpart, Ivanov said that Russia does not rule the use of veto to object to any new resolution that authorizes the launching of war against Iraq. But the U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell said this evening that Washington wants agreement on a new resolution on Iraq within weeks, repeating that the United States will move against Iraq even without U.N. backing. In Ankara, Turkish Foreign Minister Yashar Yakish said that his country would not reply to the offer of the U.S. financial aid in return of allowing U.S. forces to deploy on the Turkish lands. Earlier, Powell said that he was waiting a reply from Turkey today. Meanwhile, world's political and religious leaders continue to hold the Anglo-American belligerent stance and resolve the Iraqi question through diplomatic channels. In London, the leaders of the British churches expressed dissatisfaction over the legitimacy of the possible military action against Iraq, demanding British Prime Minister Tony Blair and U.S. President George Bush to support the U.N. experts to fulfill their work. Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamed, whose country is preparing for the Non-Aligned Movement Summit, said that the state's members of the Non-Aligned Movement would severely reject launching a war against Iraq, stressing the necessity of giving UN arms inspectors more time to complete their work. Meantime, huge demonstrations continue to be organized in different parts of the world in protest of a possible war against Iraq. 
in Rotterdam, hundreds of Greenpeace groups took to the streets in protest of the U.S. military plans against Iraq. The demonstrators tried to hinder a military vessel carrying U.S. equipment to the Gulf area. The spokesperson of the Greenpeace move said that the aim of the demonstration is to deliver a message that rejects the Dutch government's stand which supports the Anglo-American military plans against Iraq. The Bangladeshi capital witnessed today a huge demonstration in which more than 15,000 people took part denouncing the U.S. threats against Iraq. The demonstrators burned effigies of President Bush shouting slogans that condemn his sinister aggressive plans. Search operations go on to spot the bodies of people aboard the Iranian military plane, which crashed Wednesday night. Bodies of a number of the victims of the tragic plane crash plus parts of the plane have so far been spotted in search heights in the south-central province of Kerman. However, snowfall and blizzard have reportedly put the relief teams into trouble in transferring the victims' bodies. All 302 passengers on board of the military plane, which was carried a number of forces from the Islamic Revolution's Guards Corps lost their lives in the disastrous crash. The commander-in-chief of the country's armed forces, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, on Thursday, in a message of condolences to Major General Yahya Rahim Safavi, the chief commander of the Islamic Revolution's Guards Corps, or IRGC, expressed deep sorrow over the tragic plane crash in which a number of IRGC forces lost their lives. The Islamic Revolution's leader in his message also asked for thorough investigation into the disastrous incident. Separate messages of condolences were cabled on Thursday, both from inside and outside the country, on Wednesday's tragic Iranian military plane crash. President Mohammad Khatami, in his message to the IRGC chief commander, Major General Yahya Rahim Safavi, expressed regret over Wednesday's tragic plane crash, in which 302 forces from the Islamic Revolution Revolution's guards called lost their lives. The chief of Iran's Expediency Council, Akbar Hoshamir Afsanjani, in a separate message on Thursday, condoled the commander in chief of the country's armed forces, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, along with the commanders of the army, the Islamic Revolution's guard corps, as well as the families of the victims of the tragic plane crash. Parliament Speaker Mehdi Karoubi, too, condoling families and colleagues of those who lost their lives in the deadly incident. Hope the officials in charge would rapidly look into the cause behind the disastrous incident to promptly make the result known publicly. Meanwhile, Judiciary Chief Mahmoud Hashemi Shahrudi on Thursday, in a message, expressed his condolences to the leadership, the commander of the Islamic Revolution's Guards Corps, in addition to the families of those killed in the plane crash. Also in separate messages, cabinet ministers, armed forces chief of joint staff, the Islamic Revolution's guards corps, and the army expressed their condolences over the tragic event. In another development, three days have been declared as public mourning in the south-central Kerman province where the disastrous plane crash happened. Saudi Arabia's king, Syrian and Azeri presidents, Pakistan's prime minister, as well as Kuwait's emir and crown prince, in separate messages on Thursday, expressed their sympathy on the tragic crash of the Iranian military plane. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support provided by Henry and Virgilia Dakin. <laughs> 